Um, I'm just delighted to be here and present to you the evidence that uh, I have presented in court and before Congress and so on about uh, climate change, an issue that you probably have not seen from this particular perspective. So I hope you sit back and have some fun here tonight in the sense that I want you to open your minds to see what, what numbers in science actually say about this obscure and, and really it's a murky kind of issue when it comes down to what science is. So today I'm going to talk about kind of three issues. Today climate change is it's a science issue, but now it's a political issue, and it's even a moral issue. And I think I can talk about each one of those pretty much uh, equivalently because uh, from a moral issue, for example, I was a missionary in Africa. I was a minister way, way in the early part of my career. I thought about these things professionally. So this is not unusual for me to at least address things about what might be right or good or bad or, or whatnot. Um, so let's just get right, uh, go right ahead and let me, I'm supposed to carry this around with me so you can hear me. I'll tell you a little bit about why I as an Alabama state climatologist is involved in this because Alabama is in a desperate fight and we're with about 20 other states at this point uh, with the regulatory activities of the federal government regarding climate change. In fact, the EPA rules that were enacted last month on CO2 in terms of coal-fired power plants are going to further increase the cost of energy and we can demonstrate they won't have any effect at all on whatever the climate is going to do. And I'll show you some of that here. Um, why is Alabama in particular interested in this is because Alabama generates about 153 million megawatt hours of electricity per year. We consume in our state about 86. We sell the other 67 million megawatt hours to neighboring states who need them. They like electrons. Everybody likes electrons. Massachusetts uh, does not produce all of its electricity. You buy it from other states. Now, let's compare that with California, my home state. Uh, they generate about 200 million megawatt hours of electricity. They consume about 260. Uh, therefore, they import about the same amount of electricity that Alabama exports. Now, the grid doesn't quite work that way, but overall, you can see that because Alabama produces these extra megawatt hours, uh, we are able to keep the economy going and so on. And when you get down to the economics of it, you know, you're talking about over a billion dollars of revenue to the state of Alabama that is threatened by the regulatory activities that are now ongoing. And we'll get into some of those as we go along. Now, let's go, go to the uh, science part. Uh, back in 2006, uh, President Bush said America is addicted to oil in the State of the Union address. I think he was wrong. What we are addicted to are these things. We like long life, good health. We like technological progress and affordable services and freedom of mobility. You have no idea, if you've lived in another country, maybe you do a, a, a developing country, what freedom of mobility means, where you can be here and then there when you want to, or your products can be there when you want to and trust that they will get there. It's a fantastic part of an economic system. We like food, obviously, abundant and affordable. We like natural and landscapes and clean air and water, and we get that through energy that we can afford electrification, transportation, industry, and really the amount of energy we use is about one-third of each of those. In other words, the total energy that's produced kind of falls into those three categories. Now, where does our energy come from? Uh, about 87, this is a world total, 87% of our energy comes from carbon, burning carbon. Carbon plus oxygen, CO2, is created, but energy is released. About 9% nuclear, about 3% hydroelectric power. You don't see renewables on here like solar or wind uh, because they really don't bump the uh, uh, meter at all in this kind of uh, uh, context. So here's the issue. We know CO2 as a gas, carbon dioxide, is non-toxic. It invigorates the biosphere. In fact, you know, the evolutionary history of the planet occurred when the CO2 was four, five, ten times what it is today. Uh, it certainly increases food production about one-sixth of the vegetable matter that produces food is due only to the extra CO2 we put back into the atmosphere. That's a huge benefit when you think about it. One-sixth of the land you need to produce crops you don't need because of this extra fertilization in the atmosphere. So the real issue here in terms of negative aspects is the climate. Is the climate going to have some problem because we have put extra CO2 into the atmosphere? So climate change, as I said, is a science issue. This is as big as font as I could put on the page here. All science is numbers, and that's the paraphrase phrase Lord Kelvin. You have to measure something, you have to talk about numbers if you talk about science. 
You cannot talk about, I feel this is for this, or I feel about that. You have to talk in numbers. That's what we do in, in science. And I'm, there are very few people like me, a working stiff climate scientist. I actually build data sets from scratch, from radiances, from satellites or balloons, or whatever. And I will be writing code when I get back to work. Uh, on Wednesday, I guess it is, because I'm a working stiff guy. I produce these kinds of data sets about which I will be talking. So, here's a fundamental thing about science. And they're in the red. In science, a fundamental principle is that when you understand a system, you can predict its behavior. That's just fundamental to how we think science should work, the methodology of science. We understand a system, that means we can predict the outcome. Here is the forecast for three months ahead of time, made one month prior to that three-month period, uh, back in 2013-14. The country was supposed to have warmer than normal weather, nearly coast to coast. What actually happened that winter was this. It was mostly below average, some terribly, uh, well below average. In fact, I could show the same picture for last February. The forecast was for warm weather and what we have in February, the coldest February in many places, the snowiest for sure from Huntsville, Alabama to Boston, Massachusetts and many points in between. It was a cold, snowy winter. This tells you and me that there's something about the climate system we cannot forecast. We don't understand the system if we cannot, with the latest information we have in computational facilities, are able even to forecast three months ahead of time. So, how, coming back to this climate change issue, how do you test what is called the settled science of the administration's view of climate change? And I'm going to be kind of hitting the administration uh, here and there because I think they've, they've stepped well outside of the bounds of science in, in declaring things that uh, uh, I don't think they should. So the science claim, when you think about it, is that the climate system is understood so well that we can predict its behavior. In other words, we understand the system so well that we think carbon dioxide does this to the climate. That's kind of the fundamental issue here. Um, so, how do we know what's going to happen with the climate? We use something called climate model simulations. You know, a model is it's just a, a list of a thousand rules on how the atmosphere is supposed to behave in terms of physics and so on. So, what you have to do in science is define a falsifiable test. Make a claim and test that claim against independent observations and data. You can't have, as I've seen in Congress many times, an un unfalsifiable hypothesis. And that hypothesis says, whatever happens is consistent with my hypothesis. If it rains, it's consistent with, if it doesn't rain, if there's a drought, if there's a flood, if there's snow, if there's cold, if there's heat, it's consistent with my hypothesis. That hypothesis has no information for forecasting because it says anything can happen. So we have to have a falsifiable test. And one thing we can do, for climate anyway, is select a prominent metric that demonstrates the greenhouse effect in climate models. You know, not some little dinky variable somewhere. What is a prominent metric that shows the response in a climate model to extra CO2? So one such thing is to compare global temperatures. So let's go back. This is a history lesson now, and I remember this very well back in June 1988. Uh, Jim Hansen, a NASA scientist um, at the time, uh, presented to a, a Senate committee this information. He said that as the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere increase, the concentration increases, these orange and red lines will be basically what will happen with the Earth's temperature. This was made in 1988, so this is the forecast period and that is what was forecasted. Turns out more greenhouse gases went into the atmosphere than what he had anticipated so that if he had run that with his model, there would be even greater warming from these two uh, red and orange curves. If we cut off CO2 emissions, you know, basically stop being an economy, then you can kind of slow down the uh, rate of increase. That's a claim. That's a hypothesis. That's something we can test. Those are numbers we can test. We, among others, actually produce global temperature data sets. This is what actually happened over those past 30 some odd years. And these are two independent uh, data sets did this. And what you see is that the Earth's system did not warm anywhere near what was anticipated from climate model simulation. In other words, what we can claim as scientists, and I hope everyone here would say the same thing, we have falsified that model uh, 
estimate, that model claim, that model hypothesis has been falsified. The Earth system is just not as sensitive to carbon dioxide increases as is alleged here in the model. Well, that was, that was way back in 1988, which probably some of you don't even remember. Uh, might not even been born then. Yeah, probably not even been born, my goodness. Um, so let us test now the latest models. These are the IPCC AR5 report. Uh, they came out in 2013, all these model results. So another such test is to compare tropical average temperatures in the models and with the real world, in other words, with observations. A very simple test, right? Here is your model claim. Let's see what observations actually say. Now the reason we pick tropical atmospheric temperatures is a, a very good reason. This is a cross section of how the temperature of the Earth is supposed to behave, the atmosphere. So this is the surface down here. You can see the South Pole, North Pole, so it's a cross section of the atmosphere. Stratosphere is up here. So if you go to the layer that's about 10 to 50,000 feet, uh, in the tropics, you see that's where the biggest signal is. If you want to find, according to climate models, this is a climate model, these are climate model average simulations. If you want to find the response to globally increasing greenhouse gases, that's the place to find the biggest response. So let's go there with our observations. And I had uh, 102 climate model simulations in 32 family groups, and this is what the result was. The climate models all take off pretty well. Now these two dips right here, they're cooling due to volcanoes that occurred in the real world. So you see little dips here too. Uh, they're quite dramatic in the climate models. And you see the average right here is that big black line. The observations come from different independent sources. The circles are from balloons that are released and measure the temperature of the atmosphere as they go up. Satellites see the microwave emissions that are that upwell from the atmosphere and detected by sensors on board uh, polar orbiting satellites. So what you would say there is the same thing we said before is that uh, what has happened in the real world is certainly different for this prominent metric in what climate models are simulating. Another way to look at that is to think of the real world, the observational result is a target. And so you are aiming at this target of the real world with your model to see if you can replicate what has happened in the real world. And we spend in this country tens of million dollars per year on climate modeling exercises. And after 102 simulations, this is what you get in someone shooting at that target. You see that every single one missed and they all missed in the same direction, which gives you a clue that for some reason in climate models, we have an idea about what that reason is, uh, that uh, the models are way too sensitive to how carbon dioxide is really responded to in the actual atmosphere. Uh, to make it very simple, I got a call one night that uh, um, one of the uh, senators wanted to have a very simple graphic uh, to explain what was going on here, so I took the tropospheric, global tropospheric temperature, uh, you know, the, surface to about 50,000 feet, that, that layer, that's where the response is biggest. And so, okay, here's the average of the, all the models that are used to make policy and all that kind of stuff in the red line. And then those are the uh, actual observations from five different, two satellite sets, three balloon data sets show that. Um, and the next day, that chart was shown on the floor of the United States Senate in a floor speech. So if we go back to 1988, we see that that was the extent of our climate model expertise in terms of predicting the future. Now, 25 years later, we don't see a whole lot of improvement on our ability to replicate what has actually happened in the real system. So other people say, well, okay, well, global temperature should not be the only thing that you use as a metric to watch and see what climate, how climate changes. Now, no one I know thinks climate does not change. It is a dynamical system, a nonlinear, chaotic, dynamical system. It will change. All the forces never all align themselves, so you will have fluctuations all the time on time scales of thousands of years, tens of years, minutes, and so on. So climate changes, period. So what about disappearing snow? This is the northern hemisphere snow cover, the biggest way you can measure snow cover on the planet. And you can see that uh, there really is no trend there at all. In fact, the snowiest winter in terms of coverage of the northern hemisphere was just a couple of years ago. Uh, it's still snowing, in other words. 
Uh, what about sea ice? On the left you see the Arctic sea ice. So this is the ice that forms on top of the sea. And it has had a decline over the past uh, 30 years. And you can see that kind of a different case in the Arctic in the sense it's landlocked. It can't grow beyond where the, border, where the continents are, hardly at all. And so there's kind of an upper limit and it can only go downward. In Antarctica, it's the opposite. The continent's in the middle and so the sea ice can expand as it wants to. And we see that that sea ice is actually expanding uh, through the last 35 years. And, and globally, you have about the same amount of sea ice uh, when you average the one to two million kilometers per year that's lot, that has been lost in the Arctic, but the one to two million kilometers generally gained in the southern hemisphere that all kind of averages out. So what about extreme weather? I'm sure many of you have heard stories about bad weather must be our fault, human's fault. All science is numbers. If you have an extreme weather event, count them. See how many and how it has changed over time. For hurricanes, we actually count them. Uh, there are about 90 or 95 tropical storms per year. Uh, down to the more severe hurricanes, there's about 40, 45. There is no trend in terms of upward uh, intensity or frequency of these things. In fact, we are coming up uh, next month on the, no, this month, on the 10-year anniversary of Hurricane Wilma, which was the last major hurricane to strike the United States. We are in the longest hurricane drought of our country's history. We will, uh, we will have another hurricane at some point. <laughs> and when it happens, it's because hurricanes happen, not because you and I did something uh, to cause that, because you can see from the charts there is no change. Tornadoes, we count tornadoes. Tornadoes are not becoming more frequent, and uh, this chart uh, demonstrates that out through 2014. I, the last two are 13 and 14. Uh, what about really wet periods and really dry periods? The top line is for the United States wet periods, real wet periods, and this is real dry periods, drop kind of periods. You could see that, boy, this is very variable. <laughs> Up and down is what this shows. No trend in either one. They're not, droughts are not getting worse or more frequent. Floods are not getting worse or more frequent, according to this. What about globally? Here, from satellite information, we can actually create global drought maps. And what you see here is, you know, if you look at it, squint your eyes and look at it closely, there's actually a decline in the drought uh, area coverage for all categories of drought. Uh, but I would just say, you know, because of the up and down nature of what you see here, there's really no trend up or down in what you see here. What about hot days in the United States? Um, I was able to put together 982 consistent stations through time that uh, uh, determined daily temperatures, and I counted for the country as a whole as a fraction of the year how many days exceeded 100 degrees. And you can see that uh, uh, we've been very cool lately. Uh, the last two very low numbers here are 100 degree days in the country, uh, which are about as low as they go. Um, the 30s and the 50s are uh, where you really see the heat waves that hit the United States. In my state of Alabama, uh, we actually have a pretty strong downward trend. The 10 coldest years have happened since 1960 uh, in terms of the summer temperatures, which really matter. Um, so we, we see nothing but ups and downs and, and fluctuations that are typical of a climate system that uh, is forced by nature. Um, now, I'm not saying CO2 has no forcing. I, I'm not saying that at all. Extra carbon dioxide will have radiative forcing on the planet. It's how the planet responds that's where all the controversy really is. So the views of dangerous climate change rely on models that fail simple testing, as I've demonstrated and are not based on the evidence we have. Well, climate change is a political issue. And now we're going to get more interesting things here, I think. Um, because of the fact I produce these kind of data sets, I'm often called before Congress to testify and, and provide to the people's representatives uh, the information that uh, uh, we produce on this issue. But it really became political. Uh, it's been political all the time. You know, people want to do things with your life as a result of climate change and change your life. Uh, but last uh, February 2014 was where the administration really made it an issue to try to attack those 
that were not uh, uh, towing the line on a particular view of climate change. And it came out with the Secretary of State, John Kerry, who said uh, people who don't believe like he does uh, are members of the Flat Earth Society and uh, that you know, uh, climate change is the most fearsome weapon of mass destruction, things like that. Well, uh, people like me took offense to that uh, because we actually produce the climate data sets that uh, uh, tell us what the climate is doing. So we uh, wrote back in the Wall Street Journal an article, uh, or an op-ed, I should say, and the title was Why Kerry is Flat Wrong on Climate Change because uh, he used the flat earth analogy. And if you look back at the history of the ancient Greeks and so on, it was the scientists making observations that determined the world was round, not those who believed the world was flat. Uh, and so we, we think that using evidence is the way to come to some knowledge about how the climate systems work, and that's the first time I had put together the chart that so, shows the red line is what the administration is uh, using to demonstrate uh, climate change, which is only model-based, whereas the actual observations are not doing that uh, at all. Well, that gets your attention, or I've kind of been a minor celebrity of sorts in this uh, arena. But um, the New York Times came down, uh, flew a reporter down, and he uh, did a pretty nice article on me, which is strange for the New York Times to have done that. Um, and uh, what I'm doing here is I have my, um, my weather record book from 50 years ago. When I was, oh, I was just a little kid. Anyway, I, was, I took weather observation. I was a real nerd. I mean, we had nerds back then and geeks that, not many, but we were that way. And um, uh, I took 64 observations a day, observations of 64 variables per day. I was just fascinated with how the weather and climate worked. It was just a passion for me. And so I, I think it's just marvelous that I have a, you know, a vocation in which I get to follow my passion in terms of weather. Now, the average person thinks, boy, you're weird, which is true. Anyway, I love the title he put on there because he interviewed other scientists who were uh, pretty negative about me, but, but it was a favorable article otherwise in terms of what uh, uh, my uh, credentials and so on. But the title is great. Those scorned by colleagues, a climate change skeptic is unbowed because in effect you bow to authorities, but you don't bow to evidence and data. That's what I produce. That's what we produce in, and, and others around the country do as well. I'm not the only person in this uh, kind of category. Um, but, but, you know, thinking about arguments from authority, you know, this panel says this, that society says that, that's not the way science is done. Science is done by you looking at those numbers, because all science is numbers. Well, that did not go well with administration, and so they launched a congressional investigation on seven people. I was one of them. This came through a con congressman named Grijalva from Arizona. And he launched this investigation because they were just certain, I think, this is the thinking, that um, people cannot have the views like I do unless they're paid a lot of money under the table. That they, they just can't believe you would follow data. I'm, I'm guessing along the side. So they launched this investigation. The reporter here from Alabama called the office and said, why are you picking on this guy? And his response is up here, the quote. The way we chose the list of recipients, and me in particular, is who has published widely, who has testified before Congress, who seems to have the most impact on policy and scientific community, and he definitely fits that bill, and he was profiled in the New York Times. Okay, now, if you're in a university and you had that on your resume, you would be a star. But if you're in the climate change issue, and the view I have, you have a target on you. And that's what has happened as a result of this investigation. And it's an interesting situation to have people pick through your financial life because they're trying to find something on you. Um, but that's what it, this, I'm talking about. This has become a political issue. It's not about numbers of science. It's about I have an agenda to get across and you can't get in my way. And that's what I see going on, unfortunately. Well, there are some other scientific things we can do with the political side, and that is, what about these regulations? Well, uh, in 2000, uh, when was that, uh, five or six, California passed a law called AB 1493. It was a law that said cars had to have a lot fewer emissions of CO2. 
fact, the basic idea was uh, you cannot sell automobiles in California unless the fleet average is 43 miles per gallon of the vehicles you sell. Now, we can make a 43 mile per gallon car. That's pretty easy. Will people buy it? No, not, in, not on average. They need big vehicles to take their stuff, their families, and all around, and so you cannot sell an average. So every automobile manufacturer sued the states that adopted this regulation. By the way, I'm sure Massachusetts is one of those states. Um, and the fed trial was held in federal court in Burlington, Vermont, back in 2007 to address uh, the issues about this particular law that these states, California and the 11 northeastern states, adopted. I was asked to be an expert witness on uh, behalf of the automobile manufacturers. They, and, and this was three weeks before trial. And I'm, I remember the Sunday afternoon, I was sitting at home, I get this call. I thought, three weeks? You're crazy. But they explained to me what they needed done, and I said, I can solve that problem. I know how to do that. Okay, I'll do it. And then I said something that uh, uh, caused great silence on the other end. I said, and I'll do it for nothing. Because I don't take funding from any type of energy or um, uh, company or uh, uh, someone in fossil fuels or whatnot. I'm totally funded on my state and federal grants and so on. So the trial was held. My testimony boils down to the following. Let's assume climate models are correct, and this is the projection of temperature, and it's going to happen. Now, I've already given you evidence that that's not working out real well, but let's just take that off the table. Let's say the climate models are correct. That will be the temperature out to 2100. If the entire country, not just these states, the entire country adopts this regulation, here will be the response of the global climate system. And that's that. I overlaid it on top of the no response response. So what we see here is regulatory uh, action that will cost on average about two to three thousand dollars per vehicle it will have no impact on whatever the climate's going to do. That's demonstrated by scientific methods. And um, in fact, I did it for the whole world and it was three hundredths of a degree. We measure global temperature. The global temperature changes by more than that from day to day. You cannot detect or attribute a three hundredths of a degree change over a hundred years. Well, the judge in Vermont ruled in favor of the states. They said this law is okay, but he had to include in his decision the following. Plaintiff's expert Dr. Christie estimated that implementing the regulations across the entire United States would reduce global temperature by about a hundredth of a degree. Hansen, who is the same Jim Hansen from 1988, testified on behalf of the other side, the environmentalists of the states, and he could not contradict my testimony. The numbers were there. They were bulletproof. And yet, the judge is essentially saying, you have the right as a state to establish this law. Oh, by the way, it won't have any effect on the climate. Now, I also did this calculation. I showed this before Congress earlier this year. If the United States as a nation ceased to exist in 2012, no people, no cars, no factory, nothing, this would be the impact on global temperatures if model projections are correct. It's pretty much undetectable over time. We are not, as a nation, driving the bus in terms of carbon dioxide emissions. That's just not uh, the way it is anymore. And so, uh, the scientific method shows that regulations that impose higher energy costs will do nothing perceptible or attributable to whatever the climate is going to do. That is reproducible science. The EPA even will agree with that. But, you know, the real world happens. The real world happens. I have a law of sustainability. I call it my law of sustainability. And that is, if it's not economically sustainable, it's not sustainable. People just won't give out of the goodness of their hearts forever if they get nothing in return. So let's go to Germany and see how the real world affected them. Germany desired to be the number one example of environmental sustainability. They spent well over 100 billion euros on solar and wind generation, which required huge subsidies. Their electric rates rose to about 38 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, in Alabama, we pay about 9 cents a kilowatt hour. In Massachusetts, you pay about 14 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, so that makes a country uncompetitive. How can you 
build something that requires electricity when you're charging so much for it, it's built in into the cost of the product. And it turns out the poorest people in Germany expanded. I mean, they're poor, the numbers of poor people expanded because 38 cents a kilowatt hour is a lot to pay for electrons. So the subsidies are now being reduced and in fact CO2 emissions are rising in Germany. And uh, part of the reason, back to one of those points, is that you know, solar and wind just cost way too much. They, they are just economically not sustainable compared to nuclear or uh, coal here. So the economic uh, issue is, you know, rationally, it's, it's a no-brainer kind of thing if you are determining the situation based upon economics. So what you don't read in the newspapers and uh, see on the uh, CNN or anything, in fact, Germany is building coal-fired power plants. 26 are on the map here, new ones. And several are already operating now since uh, the last 10 years, within the last 10 years, because they have to have electricity to power their modern economy. And what comes from the solar and wind just does not do it. Their CO2 emissions are rising. Japan, same story. Uh, same story in, in this sense, that they uh, through Fukushima, although they have restarted some nuclear power plants now, they have cut back so much on nuclear power that the replacement for that will be coal. And so they have 43 coal-fired power plants under production or um, to be planned to be under construction or planned to be uh, constructed. Their CO2 emissions are rising. So two of the most environmentally sensitive countries, at least in, in, in the public's eye, are watching their CO2 emissions rise. You know, in the United States, ours are not rising, pretty much. And part of the reason is, in a free market economy, energy is a cost of everything we do. And if you have a free market economy, you want to get costs down for everything you produce. And so it's the economic motivation that gets people to use less energy in our country. And so our CO2 emissions are not really rising. And also the fact we're switching uh, from coal to natural gas in a lot of places. So the real world also happens in the developing world. Um, we're going to do okay, I think. <laughs> Affordable energy vastly improves the quality and length of human life. I lived in Africa, and I can tell you this one thing for absolute certainty. Without energy, life is brutal and short. And I saw it with my own eyes. Life is brutal and short without the kind of energy you and I uh, are blessed with. So the most affordable path to energy today for these folks is carbon combustion, as it is for us. And the U.S. share, as I mentioned earlier, of CO2 emissions has fallen from 28% in the 1990s down to 16% today, and it's still falling because the rest of the world is, is catching up in terms of energy production uh, through carbon. So as I said, I taught physics and chemistry in uh, Kenya. It was just a great experience to be a 22-year-old kid, 23-year-old kid, 24-year-old kid out there um, uh, teaching these people that were just thirsty for knowledge. And this is a heat lab. I taught physics. And uh, uh, what was interesting about this was um, for the heat lab, you have a, you know, a beaker of water and you take its temperature and you put ice in and see what the temperature does and calculate the latent heat of uh, melting. And uh, well, I brought the ice out. We had a little freezer in the back. And these kids had never touched ice before. And so when they touched it, to them, they, unanimously, they said, oh, it burns, I'm thinking. It's ice, it doesn't burn. But the sensation of pain in their minds had only been from burning. They had never had a sensation of cold uh, on their skin. And so there was a, a real uh, wonderful learning experience to show them something about ice. That happens because we had a little bit of energy through the electrification. Peter Motoyuki is taking the weather station uh, 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 observations there. Uh, most people go to see things like the reticulated giraffe in Kenya. But I just love the fact I got to work with the people and the students there that were just wonderful. They were terrific. Uh, but I also learned about the energy system there. I saw it every day. The source of energy there is biomass. The energy transmission system is the back of women's. They would get up in the morning at dawn, walk on average, the UN estimates 3.1 miles, 5 kilometers, to the edge of some forest somewhere, chop down 40, 50 pounds of wood, put it on their back, haul it in to their homes. And this is what happens. When the wood is burned in their huts, you can see the aerosols, the smoke here, that stuff is toxic. It's terrible. 
The UN estimates about three million children die each year from respiratory illnesses from that kind of energy system. And I can assure you, African parents don't like to see their children die. They grieve inconsolably, just like you and I would at such a tragedy as that. They're going to change that energy system. That is not good for them. Um, I remember uh, uh, one of the students, Francis Itotia, uh, I had um, uh, given assignments for the, we, we taught three months, they were off a month, taught three months, off a month like that, boarding school. First month off, I gave them all a bunch of homework assignments and so on, expected them to have it done. Came back. They all come back, no one had their homework done. What is this? They're, they're such industrious, hardworking kids. Why in the world didn't they have it? They said, well, when we go home, we have to work on the Shaba all day long, and then, uh, then it's night. I said, well, why don't you burn the firewood for light? And, and Francis looked at me with the most incredulous look on his face, and he said, my mother would never let me burn wood just for light. She carried that stuff on her back, and if it was going to be burned, it was going to be burned and all the jewels of energy for heat, light, and everything was going to be used, not just for light. So, to, if you value human life, that means you want to avoid that human, that energy system right there. That energy system kills people. And the UN verifies that. So, that energy system that you see India and China going to in terms of their emissions, uh, their emissions are rising because they're moving to that energy system that enhances and lengthens human life, whereas our uh, system here is actually because it's uh, where it is is pretty flat in terms of our emissions and all these regulations I've been talking about they're trying to bend this green line down a tiny bit and you can see that's like spitting in the ocean here it's just not going to affect anything about the global uh, climate system if it is sensitive to CO2 so that energy system is that China and India are going to is certainly much better than that for human life and we will see that that uh, uh, continues on. Well, the evidence shows that. It's not my opinion. If you look at the top chart, that's coal use around the world. Remember Germany and Japan? Their coal use is rising. Everywhere it's rising, except pretty much in the United States. And no one is following our example. Look at the numbers. Those are the numbers of coal being used. They are rising as we speak. Um, so, Finally, with the moral issue, is you have to ask a question, what is the value of human life? And uh, this is where I have to step aside from science, because I can't take you and take you to the lab and measure something called value. <laughs> you know, you just have to have an idea about, is human life valuable? Does it have some sense of importance in terms that it would be good and right to enhance human life? So, whether you would say human life is worth this much or that much, I think all of us would say it's worth a lot, especially if it's your life. <laughs> You're going to say, hmm, my life's worth a lot. Um, and so, let's just use that as our metric then. Human life is worth a lot. And now we can go back into science then as a result. So, if we are addicted to these things, it's because they kind of enhance our human life, and so they point to the value of human life in this particular issue. And here is a science uh, result, is that the more energy you use, the longer and better your life is. So if you go with the assumption that human life has value, that extending the length of human life has value, that uh, creating um, the opportunity for life to be enhanced has value, then you want morally, morally and scientifically, you want people to move in that direction so that their lives can be uh, better done. Turns out, if you look at the uh, relationship of renewable installation of electricity, you see Germany and Denmark are way up there because their costs are so high. So this is, a, uh, this is going in the wrong direction if you want to provide energy to people. You don't do that by making it more expensive. You're actually taking energy away when you make it more expensive, and that's what is happening to those countries that are up on the right uh, through their uh, edicts to use um, renewables. And here's, uh, in our country, this is a, a real big issue right now, uh, partly because if you don't make much money 
And at Williams College, I didn't see many poor people here. <laughs> this is a pretty nice place. In my state of Alabama, we have lots of poor people, many, many poor people. They're in this category. Their energy costs are a major portion of their income and expenditures. And think about it. If you drive a car, your gas tank is about the same size, whether you're rich or poor. So when you fill your gas tank, whether you're rich or poor, you kind of put the same amount of gas in it. If you're poor, it's a bigger part of your income. And so energy costs relative to uh, poverty are, are much better. So if you want to help the poor, the quickest way is to lower energy costs. You just put money in their pocket for food and medicine and so on if you want to help the poor. If you want to hurt them, the quickest way is raise the energy cost. When gasoline dropped below $2 a gallon a few weeks ago, at least in uh, our part of the world, my part of the world, uh, that's a big boon to those who can least afford energy at all. They now have the opportunity to spend that money on things that are also important to them. That, uh, uh, For example, their medical care tends to go up when they have more money to spend on that uh, aspect. If you're rich, like most of us in this room, $2 a gallon, $3 a gallon, so what? Now, this comes from India. The law of sustainability is showing up here in a moral sense. What CO2 cuts, Indian Environmental Minister Javadikar said? That's for more developed countries. The moral principle, he says, of historic responsibility cannot be washed away. India's first task is eradication of poverty. 20% of our population doesn't have access to electricity. That's our top priority. We will grow faster and our CO2 emissions will rise. It's not my opinion. It's not anything other than a fact that is occurring today. The numbers show that. So the law of sustainability, if it's not economically sustainable, it's not sustainable. So my view, lifting people out of energy poverty with carbon is morally right. Now again, we're in the moral aspect, so now this is my view. I think I showed scientific evidence to back it up, but this is my view. Lifting people out of energy poverty with carbon is morally right, but here's the fact. It is going to keep happening everywhere else, no matter what the United States does. It's happening now. The numbers show it. So in wrapping up, here's just the conclusions for my talk. What do the numbers show? The scientific method demonstrates the current theory of CO2 warming of the climate is out of step with reality. The extreme weather events we care about are not increasing in frequency or intensity. Uh, punitive regulatory controls will do essentially nothing to change whatever the climate is going to do. And CO2 emitting coal is increasingly powering the world's economies, including Germany's and Japan's, along with the developing countries, no matter what we say. Then what does my experience say? And this is where I get personal in the sense that climate change is a political issue. And there is a cost for people like me who are not politically correct. There is a cost for people like me. And if there is value, if you take the assumption that there is value in enhancing the quality and length of human life, the moral imperative is to expand access to low-cost carbon-based energy. And the fact is, it's going to happen anyway. So that concludes my talk. Thank you very much for having me here. I just have a great time here. Thank you very much. So it looks like there's a little time for questions. Great. It's ready. No, yeah, yeah, ask a question, yes. Actually, you raised a really, really, uh, really interesting point about um, Let me jump down there. Show. So Just you, ask a question here. Yeah, you raised a really many, many um, interesting points about how evidence doesn't show that um, the climate change is not happening because um, there's no, like, there's no evidence show the data showing climate ch changes happening but i also noticed that your scale is pretty small it's from 1975 to to 2025 and it's the scale is pretty pretty uh, small and then some people may argue that in a bigger scales climate change is happening and then the, there's actually a really tremendous trend up going right um this is a question about the time scale on a, on mm, three or four of those charts. Uh, the time scale is based upon when satellites began to fly. That's when we had truly global measurements of the temperature. But it's great 
because that's when the response of the atmosphere, according to models, is the strongest. It's the most recent 36 years. That's when CO2 should have seen a tremendous, the atmosphere should have had a tremendous response. And so using the last 36 years is, is a great time to look at it because prior to that, the extra CO2, there wasn't that much and it wouldn't have had much of a response. Let me go to someone else here before we come back. Okay, I see two hands here. Who's going to take the question? We'll start here. I have two questions. Um, so first of all, thank you so much for coming and speaking with us. Um, you raised a lot of good points about um, the distribution of wealth and, and technological improvements that are very necessary for a lot of people throughout the world. Um, I mainly had two questions. One is, I noticed that you didn't include the data from the Mauna Loa Observatory, which is very common um, observation that a lot of um, pro-climate science um, people bring up. And I was, I was wondering what your thoughts are about the difference between using Mauna Loa as a basis versus the tropical data as a basis. And that can ask me a second question as well. Or is, it's like Let me answer that one okay. real quick. Okay, I didn't show the Mauna Loa case. That's the one of carbon dioxide increasing through time. Uh, I showed the coal was increasing through time. That's the same thing, is that there's no question CO2 is increasing. The question is, what's the response of the climate system? Yeah, I don't have any question about the fact CO2 is increasing. In the, it's about 0.6% per year is what's going on right now. And then my second question was, um, many of your points about sustainability talked about current sustainability for current generations. But I think um, a lot of people have some skepticism as to is this rate of development sustainable given that we live on a, on a finite planet. We don't have the resources to continue to use coal, et cetera, at such a rate. Okay, it turns out that in the, in the real world, Julian Simon made a point about this, is that prices for those kinds of things determine how much we have, or I should say how much we have determines the price. So if coal became scarce, the price would go up and alternatives would be found. That's been the history of the world. And so right now there's carbon everywhere. There's natural gas, there's coal, there's um, oil and so on. There's, there's lots of it in the world today. So the price is probably going to stay down for a long time and more and more is being found because part of what people think about when they talk about the finite planet forget that this is not finite. That human ingenuity is how all these things continue to be found and developed. And bright minds like are sitting in this room are going to continue that process of human development where we do better and more with less and less as I showed on the energy curve for the United States. We produce more and more stuff with less and less energy because we're getting that cost out. It's that economic driver that actually produces the uh, lowering of emissions. So I don't know if that got to the answer to your question, but human ingenuity is the fact that you have to get in there. Okay, yes. Yeah, um, so I'm not really as much of an expert as you in terms of the science, but it's my understanding that the scientific community can look at the various greenhouse gases, you know, the nitrous oxide, the sulfuric oxide, the carbon dioxide, methane, and sort of evaluate um, the potency of them and also sort of the immediacy with which they're releasing the atmosphere is going to show effects. And it's also my understanding that most of them happen re relatively quickly, whereas carbon dioxide, the, which, is, which is also obviously the largest one within the atmosphere, the one we, that's emitted the most, has the biggest lag. Um, and I was wondering if that may, you, you understand whether that may be playing into that graph you had where curbing the emissions would, would really do nothing and whether that could actually be due to the carbon dioxide taking its effect, you know, it's sort of blatantly, I don't know. Okay. I think I understand your question is that what happens by 2200? What happens by 2300? Yeah, out that of, far yeah. because CO2. And is um, it really not, is, 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 curb, is curbing the emissions really not doing anything? You know, or is it okay. we're seeing what we're doing now? E each of those constituent gases has its own lifetime and, and action on the climate yeah. system, on the radiative balance of the climate system. Methane is much more radiatively active than carbon dioxide, but its residence time is only a week. It's a reactive gas, so it gets in the atmosphere and it gets taken out of the atmosphere. Um, uh, but in terms of uh, the models have that in them. 
they have that lag in them. And what we see is that even with that lag, they're warming much too rapidly. So that's the point you should, uh, I think, you should really examine is why are these models on which policy is based so far different from reality? And it comes back to the fact this is a murky science. We have a lot of things we don't know. As I testified before Congress, I think I used the statement, our ignorance of the climate system is enormous. And it is. Otherwise, we could forecast it three months ahead of time. We can't. We can't forecast it one month ahead of time. Um, so how carbon dioxide affects the atmosphere, um, uh, we've got a lot to work on. Whatever it is, it appears to be much slower and less than what models which have those lag processes in them are suggesting. I want to go to the back here and they'll come back here to the front. I had dinner with these guys, so they, they already pumped all the information I have out of my head. You go down here in the middle. Thank you. Um, I just had a couple of questions about, um, well, one about the um, uh, Antarctic sea ice. Um, why did you choose a uh, area-based um, data set rather than something like um, the GRACE satellites, which measure gravity and um, therefore better measure mass in the Antarctic? Okay, GRACE is a gravity measurement of the thickness of ice. That's for the continental ice of Antarctica. The sea ice is that ice which floats on the sea and is not measured by the um, gravitational effect. That's measured by microwave sensors, the team of which is housed in my um, group there in Huntsville. And so they detect the aerial coverage, which is different than what the gravity. You can see gravity needs mass. And the sea ice just doesn't make much mass. One more question you said? Um, yeah, so why? Um, and I understand that you're using it in the context of the model of um, tropical temperatures, but um, how do the models compare between global average temperature and uh, the actual data that we've been getting? Okay, the global average tropospheric temperature is that next chart I showed that had the red line, the single red line. That's the one that's the global average. Sorry, I was, yeah. you know, I was it was way at the top in small print, but oh, okay. that was the global. Yeah, I just had a couple of questions. But firstly, I wanted to ask you, so you talked about how economically using some of the resources that we are currently for energy um, is more cost effective and it's therefore it's more affordable for people, uh, especially those with lower income. Uh, but my question is, is that going forward, we see a trend right now that renewable energy sources are actually supposed to significantly fall in their costs going forward, solar energy generation and so are those not, uh, I guess, the energy production sources of the future in that sense? And uh, I'll, get, I'll let you answer that. Okay. okay the whole en renewable energy thing is a whole talk in and of itself, easily. Yeah. Um, yeah, prices are falling in those things because countries like Germany and so on are bailing out of it. And so we're ending up with China, which has lots of capacity to build those kinds of things. And they're, they're the ones producing much of the uh, products now related to that. But there's something you can't get past with renewable energy, and that's the aerial density of energy. When you look at the sunshine coming down, it's not going to be much more than 700, 800 watts per meter square at noon. And so you're not going to get very much, whereas a nuclear power plant will be 10, 2,000 times that area in terms of energy density. So when you go to renewables, you're talking about large areas of land that have to be uh, taken up, and when as soon as you start talking about large areas of land, that means you have to talk about transmission systems. You have to talk about getting rights of way to move transmission lines from your source of production to where it's used. Uh, the costs are really remarkable when you sit down and count them, and that's why you get numbers 30, 40 cents a kilowatt hour. Because, and that's from our government. Those, that's where those costs came from. Uh, they, they just don't cut it rationally when you look at economic rationality on it. They just don't make sense. And so, um, uh, Germany is a case in point. They're building coal-fired power plants. Um, oh, another question? I just have one more quick question. Uh, so I guess my second question was about, you talked about a lot about how the models that are being used right now are used as are many of the arguments for climate change and why it exists versus the actual observations and data. Now, how do we, uh, I guess, reconcile that notion with the idea that 
Um, sea levels have, have risen by about double the amount in the last decade that they have in the century prior to that. And that temperatures, about 10 of the last, 10 of the hottest years that have occurred in history have occurred in the last 12 years. How do we reconcile those? I guess ideas. Okay, you mentioned two observations. One is the sea level, yeah. which has been rising for 18,000 years. Right. In other words, the ice that was on land from the last ice age melts slowly. It rose at a rate of five inches per decade for 8,000 years when the major ice sheets were melted uh, 48,000 years ago or whatever it is. Uh, right now, it's rising about an inch per decade and has been for 100 years, but it's not accelerating. In other words, there is still land ice that will be melted. If you go back to the last interglacial period about 130,000 years ago, sea level was about uh, 18, 20 feet higher than it is today. So we know naturally that sea level should continue to rise uh, whether CO2 is having an effect or not. Uh, an inch per decade, you know, you can deal with. When I give this speech down on the coast, a different sort of speech about climate variability and preparing for that, I say, that inch per decade is not your problem. It's that 20 feet that comes with the next hurricane. That's your problem. And if you can handle 20 feet in six hours, you can handle an inch per decade. Uh, so, yeah, the sea level is rising a bit because of the um, um, uh, continued melting of the sea ice. Has carbon dioxide added a little more forcing? Perhaps, but it's such a tiny part of the noise because you're only talking about that much per decade uh, that it's hard to extract that, I think, right now. Uh, what was the other one besides sea? Uh, the, the, the idea that the last the temperature in the last... Uh, oh, if you use a surface temperature data set, yeah, those are surface temperatures, which is not the kind of metric you want to use for a greenhouse gas response. Greenhouse gases are throughout the atmosphere. They're forcing and responses in the bulk of the atmospheric mass, not the skin at the surface, because the skin at the surface or where thermometers are, are affected by untold numbers of uh, inhomogeneities. For example, you build buildings around them, the urbanization occurs. And I've published papers, as have many other people, showing how these affect the surface temperatures, show warming uh, that is not climatically related. It, it's related to how the surface uh, uh, it has been changed. OK, we'll go right here, and then I'll come back. I don't know how long we go here, but uh, OK. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to say that I don't think I'd be qualified enough to debate any of the, the facts <laughs> of your analysis. But uh, what I'd like to ask you can always try. Is, <laughs> um, why do you think that there has been such an agreement in the scientific community towards one side of this debate? And, and um, I mean, I'd like to I'd like to believe that the scientific community generally um, accepts points based on data and and uh, and uh, observation, but why do you think that's the case? Okay, I get asked that question a lot. Um, and I've got many answers that go on forever. I think one of the things is what you see in terms of these consensus reports and something are self-selected groups. They, uh, for example, the authors of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change are selected by governments because of their views. Guess what they produce? The, the, the results that you would expect. I have been a lead author myself and a reviewer throwing at them information. I said, this would not stand up in court. What you're claiming here in the IPCC would never stand up in court under cross-examination, yet it goes through anyway. The scientific bodies such as the, um, uh, say, the American Chemical Society or Physical Society or something like that, uh, they are groups of people, not climatologists, but who are, who, call in people to be interviewed who are already of that persuasion. So you're not really getting an objective slice of what is happening in climate science by that kind of process. It's a political process when it comes down to it. Um, now on the other side of that <coughs> is this interesting fact that if Congress were to vote, they would vote along the lines that I have shown here. The majority of congressmen and senators do not view climate change because they've seen information like this as uh, something to destroy your economy over, or to make things worse for people around your economy. Uh, but because of the regulatory environment and the way things have gone, I don't have time to go into that, uh, it takes a two-thirds vote to overdo the regulations, and there is not two-thirds uh, vote to do that. So laws are being made not by a democratically accountable process, but by one that is agency-driven, which is an appointed process. This young lady had a question. I can just ask that. Um, in the graph where you showed what would happen if the U.S. cut all emissions, how do you actually create that model? I'm just curious. Okay, there is, 
you understand there's a model with the carbon dioxide emissions. Well, the value of those emissions changes with time. All I have to do is just cut out the U.S. portion at 2012 and let the model run from there. And this is actually the model the IPCC and the AP, EPA use. So those numbers are, are right. Have you done the same, the whole world cut? I mean, just as a thought experiment, cut emissions? No, I haven't, but uh, I mean, if you destroy the whole world, <laughs> the human population of the world, you know, I would say you would take the U.S. portion and, and multiply that by about five. So if it were a tenth of a degree, U.S. effect would be a half degree for the world, or six tenths of a degree, something like that. This is a wild guess. Okay, I'm working myself back up to you guys. One more here, and then we'll... Um, so earlier, in response to an earlier question about like finite resources, you suggested that we pretty much use at a current rate and continue to use up all of our resources. And for someone who talked a lot about morality of human lives, um, like how do you justify leaving our children and future generations with our problems and leaving them without, like leaving them to solve these problems that we created? Okay, the, the, a lot of information or uh, points you kind of address there. You're assuming a problem is being created, um, but back to the issue of how much carbon is in the planet. You know, every year the reserves grow, so there is a lot of carbon in the planet. So we're not in a sense we're we're depleting the carbon we can get to, but it turns out the amount we can get to is growing. So there's a long time yet uh, to utilize the carbon we have. Uh, so we're not running out of that resource in that sense. Um, where uh, there are other environmental problems, and please understand me because I have advocated these other things. There are other environmental problems that are critical on the planet. You take water quality in the third world, in the developing world. There are millions who die now because their water is not pure. We know how to purify water. It is easy to do. It not only helps the human population, but it also helps the aquatic life that has to live in these places. That we know how to do, but for some reason, the environmental movement, that is not a big issue. Yet that's the one that will have a direct impact on human life as well as the aquatic life there. So, um, uh, you know, to get back to your point about I, I don't see this planet as finite because of this, because the human mind is not finite and will create the solutions as time goes. If, if some resource does uh, go away, the price goes up and we don't use it and we find substitutes for it that are more affordable. So that's always the hope of the free market system is it finds solutions because of you guys and the gray matter you have up there between your ears. And I'm so grateful in this country that we have the opportunity to have women involved in all aspects of our society because where I was in Africa, essentially half the population was left out of the solution bring because they were women. And, and women just did not have the status to in, enjoy the opportunity to attack these problems. That's slowly changing in some of these countries, but we're going to depend on you know all of us and the gray matter we have. From your experience with Congress, having testified, what would you say if you had to conjecture? Are the motives behind the 62 percent that agree with you and the 38 percent that disagree with you or find fault in what you're saying? What would you say are the motives behind it, since it's a political and moral issue? Well, you're talking about Congress, so you're talking about how can I get elected? So it turns out there are about you know, three-eighths of the country's districts in Congress that have a constituency that is, you know, leans to being kind of greenish or, or leftish in that regard. So they expect and they elect representatives who have that same view. Uh, Massachusetts would be a good example of a state that has people like that, uh, Congress people like that. Um, most of the rest of the country is not like that. They, uh, 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 view these issues as uh, very differently, uh, more uh, pragmatic. I think I told you at dinner that, you know, I, I, one of the things about being in Alabama is that a duck's a duck in Alabama. You can just say what you really see with a problem and deal with it that way. Um, and I think ultimately the data will win out, you know. It's doing it in Germany, it's doing it in Japan, it's doing it in the rest of the world. So we'll catch up with that eventually, I think. Do you see a profit motive on either side? 
the, yes. If you sort of take the Supreme Court decision, do you see sort of the yes. conservative take to have a profit motive, the liberal take to have a profit motive? The um, uh, conservative take is that we can maintain industries, okay. and those industries will be profitable okay. if our energy costs are low. We are losing industries left and right because our energy costs are rising. That's jobs for people that work, especially in a place like Alabama, where we still build things in Alabama, uh, cars and all kinds of stuff. Uh, on the uh, other side, uh, there is a, a, a profit motive in the sense that uh, companies really want to take advantage of government edicts by providing products that match up with the government regulations, uh, windmills, solar panels. You know, there's money to be made there. And so that's an incentive for them. And so they will lobby things like this. Every utility has to have 20% renewable energy. When you make that rule, now the utilities are stuck trying to find, you know, where can we find 20% renewables? And uh, that's expensive stuff. And so your rates will rise as a result. I've testified in a number of states on this very issue. And uh, the last one I testified in, uh, they voted unanimously to overturn their um, regulations uh, that were going to stop CO2 emissions and, and so on like that. Last question. Huh? I'll just say, I'll also wrap up and say um, thank you to Professor Christie for coming out and speaking to us. I'm going to give him one last hand of applause. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you very much.